Hey everybody! Today we're going to talk uh, in chapter eight. We're going to talk about the last uh, material in the second unit. Uh, again, it's it's quick reminder. Remember, um, unit two is all about I am my own person. I make my own choices. It was like, no, you are not your own person. No, you do not make your own choices. So um, today I want to talk about the effects of the groups that we're in and how they affect our personal behaviors. Okay, so. I want to talk about, you know, you know, how are we affected by the presence of others, um, how we change our behaviors in the presence of others, how our opinions change in the presence of others, things of this nature. Okay, uh, A group is two or more people who, for longer than a few moments, interact with and influence one another and, are perceived and perceive one another as an us. Um, often they share a collective goal or something in common, not just you throw five people into a room, but a group is usually has a collective purpose, a bigger goal for them to solve. Uh, college students tend to group together with other college students. Troublemakers tend to group together with other troublemakers. People tend to cluster with people that are similar to themselves. That's just normal. So this is interesting. When other people are present, uh, how do we behave? Norman Triplett did one of what would many would consider the very first social psych experiment and they had children reeling a string and if it, it, it just said reel as fast as you can and it turns out if there's other kids present watching them then they would um, reel it much faster than if there wasn't other kids present even though in both cases they just said reel the string as fast as you can uh, they also found that bicycle racers' times were faster when in competition than when they were uh, running alone. So there's something about the presence of others um, that is changing us. And so the original meaning for social facilitation was the tendency to perform simple or well-learned tasks better when other people are present. So um, the act of reeling a string is actually pretty simple. It's not complicated, okay? Uh, social facilitation occurs in animals, so this is pretty funky. An ant will excavate more sand if there's other ants watching it. A chicken will eat more grain if other chickens are watching it. A sexually active rat will mate more often if other rats are watching it. I, I'm starting to wonder if this is a, the beginning of a whatever, okay? Um, but cockroaches, parakeets, and green finches learn mazes more slowly. So the presence of others of their same species has an effect. And I mean, if we can go all the way back down to an ant and a cockroach and stuff, clearly this idea of social facilitation is is very deep in the evolutionary chain. I mean, there's something about it, something deeper. The newer definition, the more current definition of social facilitation is the strengthening of the dominant or most likely response in the presence of others. Here, for example, in this little image, Others are present, and it creates arousal. We'll, we'll answer in the next couple of slides why it does, okay? But others' presence creates arousal. The arousal strengthens the dominant response. If it is an easy task, then the arousal will increase behavior. But if it is a difficult task, then the dominant response is failure, and therefore you will be worse at it. So the classic study on this involved pool playing. And they had people play pool with either with an audience or without an audience, assuming that the presence of the audience created this arousal, right? Well, what happens, though, is they took expert pool players and they took amateur pool players. And it turns out that the expert pool players, for which the act of playing pool was a simple task, the expert pool players got better in the presence of an audience and the amateur pool players got worse in the presence of an audience. So that's what social facilitation is all about, not necessarily enhancing... Uh, not only not necessarily making a behavior more frequent, but making the most common behavior occur more. And if the most common behavior is failure because you suck at pool, then the most common behavior becomes more common. Uh, why? why? How is it? Well, why is it? Um, first off, crowding increases arousal. Um, there's been some studies showing that uh, when people go on vacation in New York City, they're... Um, the rate of their heart attacks just shoots through the roof, you know? I mean, there's something stressful about being in New York. Um, the size, the, the more the crowd is, the more stressful it is. Um, 
even a well-learned response can be altered. We've all heard of stage fright, right? It doesn't matter how many times a kid has practiced, practiced, practiced. We can get this stage fright. The arousal takes us too far. Um, being in a crowd intensifies positive or negative reactions. Um, in a crowd, people, um, friendly people are liked even more. And unfriendly, right. Uh, and a full house is a good house. Okay. So here's an interesting study about crowding. This was one that I um, actually found in some other work one time. But in that, what they have here is a little rat universe. Okay. Um, it's kind of it's kind of blurry. I see. But imagine there are four quadrants here um, where these rats can uh, interact with each other. Okay. And um, what happens is in these this little rat universe, right? You see, there's rats and there's, but we can see that there's, um, I think, a quadrants are a starting in the top right, quadrants one, and then down two, and then bottom left three, and then top left four. We see that quadrants one is connected to two, and two is connected to both one and three, and three is connected to both uh, two and four, and four is only connected to three. So we find two compartments in which there's ways to get out easily and one, two compartments where it's much harder to get out. So they threw a whole bunch of rats in there to see what would happen. Okay, Compartments one and two, because they were not connected to other as much, the rats tended to congregate. Okay, And so there was um, severe overcrowding. Okay, Congregated in... Wait, we're not... Congregated, right, okay. So the rats congregated in, in two and three is what they did. So one and four tended to get um, kind of empty. Two and three tended to get very, very, very crowded. Okay, because that was like the alleyway where they moved through. Um, infant mortality rates in compartments two and three were as high as 96%. Okay, um, it just was super crowded. The female rats just couldn't get material to build a proper nest because there was just too many rats that were they were congregating there. The male rats were really weird. They did weird stuff. They followed rats into their nests and they followed and they ate dead infants and, and I mean it was just crazy what kinds of behaviors were exhibited in those compartments where crowding got heavy. Now granted I'm hoping that human beings wouldn't get this way, but if you generalize to human crowding this implies that overcrowding could destroy society by pulling out some of the worst things that we could possibly imagine. Okay, um, it also perhaps links uh, overcrowding with aggression. Okay, and again, it's a rat study with some rats, but we can see how that might perhaps uh, come forward to humans. Okay, so clearly they do change us. What well, anyway? So we are aroused in the presence of others. That that's a statement. But why? Okay. And here's one potential reason, evaluation apprehension, concern for how others are evaluating us. Um, if others are present, but the people present are blindfolded, then social facilitation doesn't occur, right? Because presumably if there's 20 people in the same room as you, but they can't see you, well, then that doesn't, you know, you're not worried about what they're thinking about you because they can't be. Um, similar to this, driven by distraction, we're distracted by thinking about what others are thinking about us. Okay, it's the same, it's a very similar idea. Um, and so there's a conflict between paying attention to other people and paying attention to the task, and our cognitive system gets overloaded and we get aroused. However, these, these two first explanations, which are actually very similar to each other, but these first two explanations could be, could be, I, I, they're legitimate when we're talking about human beings, but as soon as we start talking about, um, um, uh, an ant will excavate more food. I'm just like, I can't imagine an ant is driven to distraction. I just can't see that as necessarily being the case. And so perhaps we fall back on kind of a cheater, cheater explanation. The reason that we feel arousal in the presence of others is mere presence. Uh, we just seem to have an innate social arousal mechanism. When others are present, we just get this innate arousal, which occurs. And there's no better explanation than that, okay? And unfortunately, it is a bit of a cheater mechanism, but it is the only one that makes sense. Um, so anyway, here's in, an interesting thing. Um, this concept called social loafing. And uh, this is a big one. It's a tendency for people to exert less effort when they pull their efforts toward a common goal than when they are individually accountable. Anytime there is social loafing, you have free riders. And in fact, this whole concept of social loafing and free riders um, is, is been, been sort of um, taken over by the political realm when talking about the healthcare debate and talking about the uh, social loafing and free riders are those that are, um, that are not paying into the insurance pool, but then when they get sick, they just 
you know, show up in the emergency room and say, hey, dude, fix me. So this is not just um, esoteric stuff. This is this is real. Um, but anyway, in the classic study, here's here's the machine. It was a rope pulling machine, and you can see it was set up with uh, six positions. You see they're numbered. You can see the six, five, four, three. I can't see the two and the one there, but assume they're up there. And uh, you see there's a rope, and it's connected to a machine on the far end there that measures how much pull, you know, how, how much how much um, effort was being put into that rope. What we find is that when there's one person pulling, I, I don't know the exact numbers, and, and it, it doesn't matter, but let me just pretend this. If one person pulls on that rope, they pull 120 pounds of pressure, whatever that means. I don't know, 120 pounds. But then, see, what Ingham did was he created a situation where he put two people pulling the rope, but what he then did was he put the second person just holding the rope and grunting behind him, oh, pretending to pull. And lo and behold, if there was two, if the person in the front believed that there was two people pulling, instead of pulling 120, they pulled 110. Then he put on three people with the two people up behind him again, holding up the rope and going, oh, and it turns out the guy in the front pulls only, you know, 100 pounds. And the more that you put on here, the less. By the time you fill it up with six people, the guy in the front is only pulling like 80 pounds, 70 pounds, something like that, when the guy could do 120. Okay? And so this concept is interesting, social loafing. It, it's clearly connected to communism. The tendency to pool, uh, for people to exert less effort when they pool their efforts toward a common goal than when they are individually accountable. So in a communistic state, everybody gets paid no matter what. Um, you know, they're paid very much. But if you work harder, you don't get paid more, right? That You don't get an extra for working harder. And here, in fact, is um, through a variety of different studies, they, they, they did a meta-analysis and they combined together the results from lots and lots and lots of different studies. And what you can see in this study, uh, in this image here, is uh, starting out on the top left, you know, if there's one person, then they exhibit 100, exert 100% 100 of their effort. Okay, that, that makes sense, right? Because, But as soon as you add a second person, they exert 90% of their effort. Three people, 90% of their effort. Four people, 85% of their effort. Five people, and you see somewhere out here at around uh, five or six, it starts to level off as far as how much effort people put into it. But uh, clearly there's this drop-off, okay? And this is hard hard to do. Um, and, and this is always why I had problems with um, uh, group projects when I was in college because they always seem to have this thing going on, and you talk about dropping down the 75% effort, and I'm like, hell no, my group partners always drop down the 1% effort or something. I mean, if if that one, if shit, negative 20, because they were they were a hindrance more than they were a help. So I never liked group projects, and um, that's, that, that's not a surprise, because I always got um, unsatisfactory on my report card as a kid for uh, works well with others. I just I never did, okay? I just never have worked well with others. So now let me look at this and let's break it down, okay? Social facilitation, social loafing. These are similar to each other. One's an up, one's a down, right? What's going to happen is that um, in one case, let's say in a relay race on the top, what's happening is that let's say it's a relay and there's four people on the team. And so the total time for the race equals one, two, three, four together. Okay? That's interesting. Look at the bottom one. You got rope pulling, and let's again let's imagine there's four people or something on, on the team. Um and so the total amount of tug that you tug at your tug of war rope is one, two, three, four together. What's the difference between these two is that in the relay race, everybody can see, and in fact, I, 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 you watch the Olympics and you'll find that they, in fact, will put not just the... They will have two clocks running. One, the amount of time that this particular swimmer has taken. Number two, how much total time has this, has this team gone through. And so each individual effort is, uh, is, is, is measurable, seeable. You can see it. Whereas in the rope pulling, even though it is also... The total uh, effort equals four put together. The four cannot be held accountable individually. Okay, and so in one case there is uh, social facilitation, and the other social loafing. 
kind of an interesting thing. This is kind of creepy. This was Phil Zimbardo again. He did the um, the Stanford Prison Study uh, earlier when we talked about roles. Uh, but anyway, de-individuation is this loss of self-awareness and evaluation and apprehension. Um, when you're in a group situation, but um, you cannot be um, identified. In particular, uh, here in this study, he had people giving um, he had people giving uh, electrical shocks. Uh, th these were these were women at uh, Columbia University too. That and and they just took an innocent woman and they had this group of women, you know, these other group of women. Um, your job is to decide how much electrical shock you're going to give her, you know? And uh, it was just crazy. I mean, what an interesting experiment. And uh, half of the groups of women had hoods on their heads and half did not. And in the group, in the situation where, um, the condition, in fact, where the women had the hoods on their heads, they, um, ex they, they, they said, shocker, 175 volts or something, you know? So they, they call for a much higher level of electrical shock if they had the, the, the thing on their head. This obviously um, helps to explain the, the behavior of um, people in uh, mobs, right? This is the mob mentality. If you can't identify who you are, then... Um, you're not responsible for your actions. And it's kind of a scary thing. Um, I don't remember. Here's a, here's a good quote from somebody. Boy, I wish I remembered who. Um, a true measure of man's character, of course, a woman too, right? But I mean, a true character, of no, a true measure of man's character is what he does when no one is looking or what he does if no one were to find out about it, or something like that. You, you get the idea that, um, you know, later on we're going to talk about helping behavior, and we're going to find out that people are much more likely to help if other people can, you know what I mean? But, yeah, okay. But it's the same kind of a thing, okay? Um, and here, underneath my face here, there's a, an interesting study. I can't remember the details of it, but it, it was a similar study where it involved um, children and uh, trick-or-treating. And there was, of course, a bucket of candy on the porch with a sign that said, uh, please take just one piece of candy. And they looked at different factors about who, you know, how many pieces each kid took. And it, it, it ended up being um, a factor of how big the group of children was. Um, if, they, if the kids came in a group of 20 kids, then they were more likely to break the rule. Or if they uh, had uh, Halloween costumes that were much more um, um, d d disguising. They, they were much more likely to break the rules. So, kind of a funky notion. All right, here's a uh, kind of a, a scary one called group polarization. This is, um, in fact, I'll, I'll give you a little observation. I remember when I was a kid, when uh, when kids were naughty, they would be sent to juvie hall, right? You send the boys to juvie, I guess you send girls too. But, you know, you send the kids to juvie hall. And here's my observation. I was just a little kid. What did I know? But, my observation as a little kid was that when kids, when when these kids, these boys in particular, but when these kids came back from juvie hall, they came back worse than they started. They came back worse. They didn't come back better. You didn't make them a better person. You made them a worse person um, for a lot of reasons. I mean, you made them very angry. That that was part of it. But I mean, more than that, they just became more bitter, more upset, more. I mean, just so many more aspects of it. And that's what group polarization is about. Group produced enhancement of members' pre-existing tendencies, a strengthening of the members' average tendency, not a split. That is to say, um, the kids that go to juv juvie hall tend to be naughty kids, and they tend to have attitude problems. And when you put a bunch of kids together that have attitude problems, they come out with worse attitude problems. Here on the far on the right side, right underneath my face. They took these two groups and they gave them some kind of a prejudice test. I don't know what they gave them. It doesn't matter. And so then they took the top 25% in prejudice and the bottom 25% in prejudice, isolated them, and they took the top 25% and they had them talk together about prejudice and have discussions about it. And they took the bottom 25% and they had them talk about prejudice. And then they brought them out afterward and then they measured their prejudice again. And lo and behold, those that were low in prejudice, when they talked together in a group, came out even lower in prejudice. Those that were high in prejudice that walked out afterward, after talking to other people who were high in prejudice, walked out even more prejudiced than they were when they started. So, 
as I said right at the beginning, I said college students tend to form groups with college students, troublemakers tend to form groups with troublemakers, we tend to form groups with people that are like us, and unfortunately this means that whatever we brought into the situation tends to get magnified. Freshmen have widely varying opinions, seniors tend not to. Um, it, it, they've done this in a variety of ways, say the political opinions of freshmen. And it turns out the political opinions of freshmen tend to be somewhat varied, but the political opinions of college seniors tend to be fairly fairly equal to each other. Uh, group polarity in communities. People self-segregate and become like-minded. That is to say, um, I self-segregated when I uh, bought the... Uh, when I purchased my house, I made sure that I bought my house in a neighborhood that in, included people very similar to myself. That That's what I did. I mean, it's it's a true statement. Um, and then the act of being around people that are like myself makes me even more like. And so if I was a member of a... <laughs> whatever. <laughs> All right. We got together. Um, the Internet has provided a whole new way for, for people to uh, meet each other. Um as an example, they have these new anorexia support groups. And uh, when I say support groups, I put the support in quotes because really what it is is it's girls with anorexia that are encouraging each other in their anorexia. Good job, Kim. I can see an extra rib today. And it's like, okay, dude, no, 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 no. Um, we find that this group polarization is making these anorexic women even more anorexic, okay, if you can imagine such a thing. But it's also allowing terrorists to find each other. It's allowing neo-Nazis to find each other. And so we're finding group polarization going on on the Internet and extremist groups coming uh, more and more uh, common. Uh, why does it happen? Um, number one, because group discussion in, uh, elicits a pooling of ideas. Let's say... Um, if I was a highly prejudiced person and I had a hundred reasons to hate a particular racial group, I talked to some other guy and he gave me 20 more. All right, 20 that I hadn't come up with. So we pulled together our ideas. Um, also because um, uh, social comparison, okay, pluralistic ignorance. When I self-segregate, I tend to fall into this false perception that everybody thinks like me and therefore that makes this an acceptable thing. If you take group polarization in, and you sort of extend it out to its next logical conclusion, you get this thing called groupthink. Groupthink is a mode of thinking that persons engage in when concurrent seeking becomes so dominant in a cohesive in-group that it tends to override realistic appraisal of alternate course. Blah. So what happens? A group of people is working together on a problem. And in fact, one, uh, a lot of people blame the Challenger disaster to groupthink. And so imagine a group of NASA astronauts sitting around and they're like, okay, let's have our final discussion about pre-liftoff routines, okay? And are we ready to go, you know? And here's the deal. Let's say five people in that group out of 100 scientists, five of them are thinking, you know, there is a problem. There's something I'm not, I just don't feel completely comfortable about. But guess what? The first person doesn't say anything. The second person doesn't say anything. What basically happens is this guy says, I don't feel completely comfortable. In fact, five different guys are thinking, I don't feel completely comfortable about, about this launch. There's something about it that just doesn't feel right. But you know what? Gosh. Oh, nobody else is saying anything. Um, Apparently, they feel okay too, right? I mean, yeah. long as Bob's not saying anything, as long as Jer Jerry's not saying anything, I... Yeah, I guess my, my my feeling of uncomfortableness, maybe it really doesn't mean anything, right? Maybe that's what it comes down to. And so what happens is, in, in theory, every single, every 100 scientists could have a problem. Every single one could have a problem, and every single one could fail to say something because every single one looks around at the other people and says, well, nobody else is saying anything, so I guess I'm the only one. I mean, who am I to say, if there's 99 people that think it's okay, who am I to say that it's wrong, Okay. So all, for all we know, all 100 people are thinking exactly the same stuff. There are certain uh, conditions that enhance groupthink, and, and these shouldn't be surprising based on some of the, um, uh, the, the variables and factors we talked about earlier. Uh, a highly cohesive group has more groupthink. Okay? Again, that's not a surprise when we talked about the, com, com, uh, the old compliance and obedience stuff, right? Um, insulation of the group. Whoa, this is starting to sound like that cult stuff, right? 
uh, group think can arise, the more cult-like the group is. A lack of methodological procedures for search and appraisal. Uh, okay, we'll talk about a devil's advocate in a minute. Directive leadership. We'll talk about leadership styles. High stress for... Blah, 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 blah. What are some of the symptoms? And you can read all of this. However, groupthink has become a, um, a major topic among the business community, the business world. And in fact, groupthink is was particularly troublesome in Asian cultures, which have an incredibly strong um, hierarchy, a hierarchy based on age and uh, seniority, well, but really age. And so what happens is, um, let's say, for example, in a Japanese business, the boss says, I think we should do plan X. All 100 of his employees goes, you know what, boss, that's a great idea. Even if all 100 of his employees think it's the stupidest idea in the world, all 100 will say it's a good idea because everyone is afraid of stepping on the boss's toes. So instead, they've now created this new setup where they'll run a meeting and everybody in, in Asian societies, by the way, everybody knows the social hierarchy. Everybody knows who's, who's the top, who's the second. I mean, it's not a hidden thing at all. And so now what they'll do is they'll take the person at the very, very, very bottom of the hierarchy and get their opinion first and then the second person in the hierarchy and the third and the fourth and work the way up to the top because here's the deal every person that gives their opinion has every blah, when when the 15th person gives their opinion all 14 people that gave an opinion before him or her was lower on the social hierarchy therefore I'm not worried about offending them right because they're all below me they have a lower status than I do so I if I disagree with them, I'm not afraid to say I disagree with them because they're below me. Okay, so you get the idea here. They've 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 really taken this notion of groupthink and taken it to heart and and have set up a system to eliminate it. Okay, um, how to prevent groupthink? The leader should be impartial. Uh, the leader's job is to uh, guide, and not to uh, impose. Encourage critical evaluation. You always assign a devil's advocate. Um, when you get to the end and you say, we're going to do plan X. Now, John, your job is to go out and tell us why we should do plan Y. Okay, and so John will go out there and his job is to um, figure out why those those reasons that plan Y would be the best. Okay, sometimes it's good to break the group apart and then bring them back together. Inevitably, as they work in separate groups, they will go in different directions. Um Keep the group open to potential outside experts, okay? And call a second chance meeting, a last chance meeting or something to air lingering doubts, okay? Allow for lingering doubts. Tell everybody, look, um, even if it's just a little blip in your mind, you just feel free right now to, to let it out. Because, again, as we said earlier, with the conformity and the compliance stuff, if one person just says, you know, I just... There's something about this that just is making me uncomfortable. I don't know what it is. Then all of a sudden, the other four people in the group are saying, you know what, I, I was feeling the same way, but I can't verbalize it. And all of a sudden, now you know the truth. You know that five people are disagreeing. Okay? So, it, it, it's a good idea. All right. So now, how do individuals influence the group? Mm, this is less exciting, and it turns into a study of leadership, which is, yeah, whatever. Um... A minority that never wavers can sway a group. So, say for example, if one person on a jury, you know, 11 people say guilty and one says, no, 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 I think he's innocent. If this one guy just says innocent, 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 eventually, as long as he's completely consistent, he can sway the group. Or if you have self-confidence, you can sway the group. Even if 11 people think guilty and one says innocent and does so consistently with self-confidence while sitting at the head of the table okay what's going on just like we keep talking about with the group thing is that one minority that one person that is breaking from the group now has broken the 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 perception of unanimity right that whole idea that everybody thinks this way uh and it moves us into leadership okay that is to say, is leadership minority influence? And in a lot of ways, it is if you're a good leader. Okay, Leadership is the process by which certain group members motivate and guide the group. Okay, That's interesting. There are different types of leaders. Um, 
task leadership is leadership that organizes work, sets standards, and focuses on goals. Um, yeah, um, that's important, but task leadership is, um, um, leadership that focuses on the bottom line, making the profit, right? That's, it's not, it's not effective in a lot of ways. I mean, it is. If your goal is to make money and you have no other goals in life, yeah. Social leadership is leadership that builds teamwork, mediates conflict, offers support. Okay. Transformational leadership, on the other hand, is is in some ways the best kind. Somehow, leadership that enables uh, that is in that pfft, leadership that is guided by a leader's vision and inspiration. Okay, it changes. See now, task leadership and social leadership can change the behavior of subordinates. Transformational leadership can change the beliefs of the subordinates, which then lead to changes in behavior. Um, Transformational leadership often leads to happier employees, which are then more productive employees, right? Because um, you could either say, uh, as a task leader, you could say, the best solution is do the work this way. A transformational leader says, look, what I'm trying to accomplish is, and maybe you can see the way I'm doing it, and convinces the employees that it is the best way. Okay, and so one, they both lead to changes in behavior, but one changes to a, uh, leads to a change in beliefs, which perhaps increases behaviors as well. Um, I don't know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, they're cute, I have a dream. Yeah, I see, transformational leader, I have a dream, I have a vision, and Martin Luther King Jr. is trying to pass the vision onto people and change their beliefs by passing his vision to them. Um, let me see this. Okay, here. Um, the rest of this slideshow is kind of just filler, I'll admit that. So let me just sort of uh, blow through it and point out a few things that are of interest. Managers versus leaders. I like this. A manager focuses on things, a leader focuses on people. Managers do the right thing. Leaders do the right things. Do things right. Do the right. A manager sets a plan. A leader inspires. A manager organizes. A leader influences. A manager directs. A leader motivates. Creates intrinsic motivation towards a bigger goal or something. You get the idea here. Managers and leaders are not necessarily the same. Um, the Hope you know. Hopefully they are, but a good manager can become a leader. Um, great leaders live with integrity, lead by example. Yeah, clearly, the best uh, military generals are the ones that. <laughs> Woo! Isn't that the best military leader uh, generals are the ones that um, that lead their troops in the battle? Okay, that physically get out at the front. A great leader will develop a winning strategy or a big idea. Okay, they'll build a good management team. All right, inspire employees, create a flick, blah, 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 blah. This is an interesting video, by the way, on uh, social intelligence and leadership. How leadership, um, and we talked about it at another point, we talked about uh, charisma. Charisma is a humongous in, uh, factor in leadership. Um, and to some degree, charisma is something you're born with. It's a, 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 a trait but it can also be taught, okay? You can also teach uh, charisma to some degree. Uh, great leaders are passionate about what they do. They love to talk about it. They have a lot of energy. Um, their thinking is clear. They um, they are able to communicate to a diverse audience. Now, this is hard, by the way. It's, it's really hard to cater the same message to a wide range of people. That's really hard to do, okay? Uh, blah. Uh, blah. I mean, I didn't write this stuff. I just copied and pasted it, you know? Uh, empowers people. Cheerleader. Gives a sense of accomplishments. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, le oh, leadership traits. Traits that, um, that seem to be associated with leadership. Intelligence. The more intelligent somebody is, um, the better they, they become leaders. I mean, that's just, again, it's correlations. These are all correlations. Um, those that are more knowledgeable, those that are able to get things done, make better leaders. There doesn't seem to be any connection between physical characteristics and leadership traits. 
and that surprises me because I've seen um, uh, size, like uh, uh, height, height being a physical, uh, a large component in other stuff, but this is what I'm seeing here. Um, other factors such as verbal facility, yeah, being able to you find the right words to pass along a message. Uh, uh, honesty, initiative, aggressiveness. These are things that, um, in particular, self-confidence. These are the characteristics which are associated with great leaders. Blah, 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 blah. Participating, telling. I don't know. I'm not... If you want, this would be... Um, clearly a part of industrial organizational psychology. I mean, I am not an IO psychologist. Um, it's interesting in, in, in context here, but you can see my particular opinion on IO psychology, though I think it's very important. My opinion is boring. Uh, yeah, okay. So I think that there's nothing huge and wonderful left in here. Yeah, there's nothing huge and wonderful. All right, so that fill, fills us in through the end of um, the second unit, right? That will get us through the uh, second exam. So uh, hopefully you'll be taking that exam pretty soon and uh, pulling out an A, huh? Right? Yeah? Whatever. I'll see you the next time for Chapter 9.